that, I would like to um, have an answer on one of the questions from Tammy for the the lump sum funding, the the forward funding of the yeah. percent Is that only going to be for admin and supportive services? No, or no. I mean, those, we're going to provide up to thirty percent. I'm not sure if we're going to go all the way up there, but up to thirty percent forward funding. Um, if that needs to be used for the wages, I mean, that can be, um, but um, we're not going to be taking that money out of that specific line item, so there will, you have, we'll be doing adjusting as we go. The wage line item um, will be charged once we can verify payroll. All right, great. And, okay, so now, Sheila, if you are ready, we're going to move your presentation over and open it up for you. And talk fast again, right? <laughs> no, we're we're good today. We're a little bit better this time. <laughs> All right. Well, of course, whenever you get a lovely grant, there's always rules to it too. You know, the way you can spend the money or what you can do with it. So I'm just going to kind of go through some of the fiscal requirements related to the grant. Um, I, I urge you all to at least skim over your grant agreement. It would be good if you read it. However, it is a very lengthy document. I think the last time I knew it was like 40 to 50 pages long. Um, and some of the things are listed here that will be in your grant agreement on how you need to handle them, you know, your audit requirements, what your accounting system should look like, subgrantees, internal controls, your expenditure of funds, allowable costs what to do in a, for a budget variation, program income, and what kind of things you need to do for monitoring. <clears throat> um, as far as audit requirements, most of you um, are probably going to be subject to the standard audit. Uh, unless you expend more than $500,000 in a year or in a fiscal year of federal funds, then you'll be subject to the single audit. But those requirements will be outlined in Part 3.1 of your grant agreement, so please Look at those. Um, the audit report is due no later than nine months after the period that's been audited, and it is on an annual basis for the life of the grant. So you can read those requirements, and it does tell in there where to submit those reports to, I believe, to our internal audit section. Um, you must use fund accounting for accounting for your grant funds. You will have to submit the quarterly financial status report that Tammy was talking about and the supporting documentation that you need to provide to us to support your fiscal operations is the trial balance. That has to come from your accounting system. It cannot be just an Excel spreadsheet that you create. It's got to be from an accounting system. And the, the reason is we need to be able to trace your grant expenditures and account for them, that they are within the right budget lines that you have set up in your system. Um, well, we will tie the grant revenue and expenditures to what you have told us you've expended those dollars on when we have to report in our GRS system. So that has to be segregated in your accounting system. You know, if I come in and I say I want to know how much you spent on this grant, then you have to have the ability to run something that shows me just those grant expenditures and revenues. Um, here's like an example of what a trial balance may look like. This is a very simplified version. Um, you know, showing the, the expenditures on the left-hand side there for salaries and friends, supplies and training, and then your grant revenue. So that's just a very basic one. Um, I, I would imagine just by the looks of this, this probably came from something like QuickBooks or something similar. Uh, fiscal reporting requirements. Um, it will say somewhere in the grant agreement, I'm not sure the exact location, but your financial management system shall be structured to provide accurate, current, and complete disclosure of the financial results of the project funded under this grant program. Um, your general ledger must support your costs and revenue that are reported to us, and like I said, it must allow the tracing of the funds to a level that's adequate to ensure that the funds have been expended appropriately and for the grant scope of work, you know, to meet the needs of the grant, what it was written for. If any of you are going to possibly use subgrantees for part of this program, then you must obtain written approval from DCEO before you provide any of the portion of the funding to those subgrantees. Uh, your subgrantees must be aware of any terms and conditions that are in the grant, and they have to abide by them, just like you do. You actually, as the grantee, are the person who will be held accountable for your subgrantee expenditures as well. 
Um, you know, if there's a, you have to require a closeout from a subgrantee, and you also have to require any refunds from them, which would be any revenue they received in excess of cost. <coughs> There, you must have an adequate internal control structure. You know, like I said, the grantee will be accountable for all the grant funds that you receive and those expended by your subgrantees as well. Um, so you have to maintain effective control over all those funds, equipment, any property, or any other assets that you do obtain under this grant. Um, your internal control structure and internal controls within your organization should be consistent consistent with GAAP, which is generally accepted accounting principles or practices, whichever way you want to say it. I just say GAAP, it's shorter. Um, some examples of some internal controls would be that you have written policies and procedures that have references to the applicable regulations that you are required to follow. Uh, your bank reconciliations are done timely. And in addition, they are reviewed and approved by someone other than the person who has completed them. Um, you know, there was a situation in the city of Dixon where the woman basically absconded with $53 million. Uh, I would say that they were lacking some internal controls in that organization to allow that to happen. Uh, you have to have a segregation of duties. You cannot have one person that's in charge of receiving checks, depositing those checks, posting the checks in your ledger, and you know, also verifying and doing the bank reconciliation. That, that person has way too much control over the cash in that organization. Um, so you need to have some segregation of duties um, where other people are doing part of that function. And then there must be a proper approval of any disbursements that you're making. You need to have supporting documentation for your disbursements so that we can trace it to an actual invoice or, you know, it just supports what you've paid. Um, and you should cancel them to prevent subsequent misuse or duplicate payment, or there should be some sort of control in your accounting system to also do that as well. Here are some things at a minimum that your policies and procedures manual should contain. Um, you know, just some various, you know, items that you should have procedures on, bank reconciliations, you know, how you handle cash depositing, how you handle disbursements, how you handle your cash management, any cost allocations that you may do. Um, you know, there, there's a whole list of them here. Procurement, procurement's a big one. Travel, most of you probably have travel policies and rules on how much you'll um, pay people for travel <coughs> expenditures. So this is at a minimum what we would like to see when we come out, um, for those of you that we're going to be doing free awards for, uh, we will ask for your policies and procedures manual. And some of the other ones, we've probably already reviewed them if you have WIA experience or we've monitored you in the past. Now, related to your expenditures of funds, your expenditures under this grant have to be for the performance of the tasks that are set forth in your scope of work. You know, we're not going to allow you to expend funds on something that doesn't meet the grant objectives. Um, you know, if we do find something, then we'll require a refund from you for any grant expenditures, you know, that if you've got excess revenue over what your expenditures are, then we will require that refund. So like I said, any unearned revenue at the end of the grant period has to be returned to us. Um, you know, your grant expenditures should be done in accordance with GAAP. Um, sound business practices, you know, the prudent person theory. You're not going to go spend $300 on something that might cost you $100 somewhere else. Um, you know, think of it as your checkbook. If you were buying that item, um, would you spend $300 on it or would you spend $100 on it? Just because it's the government's money doesn't mean you should spend more money on it. Because <laughs> remember, these are your tax dollars. came from your tax money. Um, and your, your grant expenditures also should conform to the terms and conditions of the actual grant agreement. You can't exceed the total amount that would, like I said, be incurred by a prudent person. And of course, your accounting should be consistent with GAAP. Again, GAAP, we keep saying that. Uh, allowability of costs. The grant will only pay for those costs that are necessary to complete the program objectives for this particular program. Um, unnecessary costs will be prohibited. Food, alcohol, entertainment, gifts, donations, fundraising, promotional materials, they're all prohibited. 
You can't pay fines, penalties, interest costs. Um, uniforms and tools will be allowable if it's required for the work site. And any field trip costs, as Tammy identified earlier, um, they may be allowable depending upon the career component that you're dealing with and if it relates to what they're doing. Um, any duplicative costs that we may find that are incurred for any clients who may be co-enrolled in another program, they will be disallowed. And you must have arm's length bargaining. Um, basically think of this as in your procurement and your purchase of goods and services has to be you know, with fair and open competition. I can't give my brother an agreement just because he's my brother. Um, you know, I really need to kind of get out of the conflict of interest possibility there. Um, I need to actually, if I've got an agreement and I need to procure it, I need to make sure it's open and fair and other parties have an opportunity to bid on it as well. You know, you cannot charge yourself market rate for rent or training and then pass the cost on to the grant. It must be reasonable. And compensation for employees um, must be reasonable for the services that are rendered. And you can't just take this grant and distribute the earnings in excess of cost just because you've got the money or just because it was on the grant agreement. Um, if you do provide bonuses, they must be um, pursuant to an already established written policy that you have and that is consistently followed by your organization. Um, there, there also is a salary limitation um, that the federal guidelines use. You know, we don't want to see anybody making a whole bunch of money off of a grant here. I don't think we'll run into that problem, though. <laughs> um, you can't have any reserves for like a severance pay package or unemployment insurance. Um, you know, that's unreasonable. If you think you're going to have something like that, then you need to contact us so we can discuss it and we'll kind of go through it and see if what you're doing is going to be allowable or not. Um, contract employees, you have to properly classify them and they have to have proper documentation. You know, executed contracts, 1099s, invoice, you know, documented invoices that detail out the work. Um, and then there's a note there about exempt organizations. Um, and what the, the IRS will look at that, some of those. Travel expenses, you should um, be in accordance with the latest state of Illinois travel regulations or a reasonable policy that you have in place at your location or your organization. Uh, you must retain receipts and document any kind of travel expenses that are reimbursed. Um, allocation of costs, if, even if your proposed budget says you have like you know, okay, we're going to spend 10% on payroll and facilities costs. Well, that doesn't automatically give you a blanket authorization to just automatically charge the grant 10% for these particular costs. You still have to document and justify the actual activity for the, the payroll and the facilities costs to verify that, yes, that grant did benefit 10% of your organization was, you know, benefited to that grant for those activities. Um, if you do do a cost allocation, you have to have a written plan that details out the allocation methodology, because um, we will be looking at that when we come out to monitor. If you do feel that you need a budget variation for your grant, you need to do that sooner rather than later, because um, we are working on such a short term here. Um, you know, you get into this program and you're like, well, you know, I, I think I need, I don't need as much in admin, but I need some more supportive services. Um, you definitely need to get in touch with Tammy right away so that you can work on getting a budget modification done on the grant as soon as possible. Um, and you can work with her on that because she'll be the one doing all those <laughs> if you do that. You have to remember you have to keep them within the, um, the percentages, though, which is this no, no less than 70% wages, no more than 20% uh, program support, and no more than 10% in admin. And that's cost, too. Not just budget, but that's what you spend. Um, related to program income, it, because we are going to be advancing you some funds, possibly, as part of our, you know, to get the program up and running, uh, you must keep those in an interest-bearing account and maintain them until they're used in accordance with the grant agreement. Um, and if you earn any interest that's earned on those funds that are in that interest-bearing account, 
um, then you must spend those interest dollars or pennies, whatever you get. Well, usually it's pennies today. Um, you have to spend them on grant activities or they get returned to the department at the end of the program. Now, monitoring the grant will be monitored for compliance with the grant agreement and any other programmatic rules, regulations, or other guidelines that the department implements for the program. Uh, there will be an on-site fiscal monitoring that will be completed um, probably after the program or towards the end of the program. And there will be some on-site programmatic monitoring and or technical assistance available if you need it. I think is that it? Oh, that's it. Now we got questions. OK, um, I'm, I'm trying to get a clarification from Linda about the last question. Can you tell me what supervisors you mean? Um, <clears throat> all right, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to go down. Um, we did have a question about uh, youth logging into a special porter, portal in Illinois WorkNet. It is not up right now, but it will be IllinoisWorkNet.com slash summer 2013. So we can, um, so that, that once it is up and we've gone over things tomorrow, then you will be able to start entering uh, information on there. Um, Tammy, could you uh, share with the audience one more time what forms, which forms they need to have submitted? The authorized signature form. Um, there's two of them. One is the primary authorized signature, and then the other one is, is if you're going to designate somebody else as a signature, you can submit that one too. We, we, are, we are starting the grants today, so uh, as I get these, we're, we're, putting, we're starting your grant, and I just want to make sure we have the right person um, associated with those responsibilities. All right, and then uh, do, do we complete one work site assessment before the youth are placed at the sites, and is it to be completed only once? Yeah, you should. You need to do a pre-work site assessment. You you want to get out there and look at these sites. You don't want to just randomly place them in some place that you're not. You know, you haven't been out to see. So you should assess the site prior to placement, and then you should monitor them after placement. So at some point, you need to go out and make sure that they're properly su supervised. Um, you know that the youth are actually showing up and putting in their hours. Um, you know, and that it's a good work experience. And I would document that you went out there to do that second assessment somehow. Mm -hmm. And you can use that assessment form for both of those. All right. And does single audit mean they are requiring program-specific audit? Um, uh, <laughs> I need to double check on that, but I think it's just an audit of the organization itself. OK. Um, it and should be outlined in that grant agreement in 3.1, but I'll double check on that and see what I can find to see if I can find the actual language. OK. And do we send youth payroll through the state's payroll system or through our own? I had answered online that we uh, will have a special uh, spot on our uh, grid that we will be explaining about where they can go to upload payroll. Right. Um, pay, pay, they're going to be doing the payroll themselves. So that, that organization, the grantee, is the employer of record, and they are making payroll. Um, what they're doing is they're uploading documentation of that payroll in Illinois WorkNet, and so we can validate and verify. And then what we'll do is we'll approve a cash request for the organization here internally. So once we've validated that their payroll looks, looks um, reasonable and is, is accurate, then we'll do a cash request. And then within 8 to 10 business days, then the grantee will receive funding from that cash request. But payroll is done locally. It's done with, at the grantee. Okay, great. And uh, for supervisors, can we, and she, by supervisor she means person overseeing the program, monitoring work sites, et cetera, um, from, I'm believing from the grantees program, uh, for supervisors, can we include their salaries in the 10% or 20% of supportive and administrative costs, or is that program costs? That, no, that would uh, that'd be in the 20%. Okay. So that would be and program services if they're, they're going out and doing site monitoring of the work site. All right. And uh, we have another question. Let's say workers started today before they have actually applied on Illinois WorkNet. Will they still be paid for the hours before they're inputted into the system as long as we have documentation on file? Yeah, you make sure that they're eligible. 
and you need to get that information once once um, um, WorkNet the application isn't up yet, but once that's up and available, you need to get that information in there to, as quickly as you can. But yes, we have a, a July one start date, so you can start incurring cost as of July one. Here's okay. a question from Susan. There's a question from Susan. It says, we included costs for background checks in our budget. Do we need to take those costs out since we're to use that family watchdog and move those funds to other areas? And I would say yes. Yes. Uh, you, do, you, don't, you, know, you don't need to have budgeted in there um, funds for background checks with a family watch, the watchdog, family watchdog. So you can reallocate those funds to uh, other supportive services right, or administration. Great. great. Um, all right, so now that we have those questions answered, what I would like to do is talk about the points that we need to remember. And if you have any more questions, we still have three minutes, so if you've got some other questions, you can uh, put them in the chat pod and we'll try to get them answered. Um, we do have some points to remember. You need to make sure that the eligibility of the youth participating is documented and must be included in their client files. Worksite monitoring is required initially, as well as continued worksite monitoring to make sure that there's proper su supervision and compliance from your worksite agreement. Payroll verification and timeliness. Make sure that you are submitting timesheets accurately and, and uh, on time. Document, document, document. Verify, verify, verify. Make sure that whatever you're doing is in the files so that when an audit comes up, it's there. The general ledger must support costs and revenue. The Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity will be checking this and will be allowing trace funds to make sure that the um, proper funds have been expended appropriately. Grant funds will only pay for costs necessary to complete program objectives, and you cannot pay for field trips. You cannot pay for gifts tchotchkes, promotional items. Uh, uniforms are only allowed if they're required by the work site. And there will be penalties if these uh, costs are not properly administered. And compensation must be reasonable for services rendered. You cannot, uh, cannot be for distribution of earnings in excess of costs. And if you've got the opportunity to spend $300 or $100 for the same item, Remember, it's your tax dollars paying for this, so use the lesser cost item. All right, we have um, okay. We have one more question here. It says, "We were we going to go over the appropriate documentation to prove their eligibility?" Something about Appendix A. Yes, and I can answer that. Um, and the procedures manual under Appendix A we define. So the, the eligibility is based upon uh, participation in one of the services like um, um, school lunch program, SNAP program, uh, TANF, um, WIA participant. Um, and in Section A of the procedures manual, it, it identifies each of those and, and the appropriate documentation or information on that specific That's eligibility requirement. So uh, um, reference Appendix A in the procedures manual. Um, and you said earlier that most of the documents need to be within the past six months? Yes. All right. Okay. And we have uh, one last question about is a copy of the PowerPoint in the available? And everything is in the program overview files in the chat pod below the chat pod. You can download all of those documents. And if you uh, click on the... Uh, little drop down option at the bod at the top of the pad you can download all documents um, the response to the question about whether documentation can be completed after the youth are in place working yes but please make sure that they are eligible before you uh, submit them and have them start working all right I think there was a question from LaDonna Russell too here says if a youth is already at a work site and the work site wants to transfer youth to the summer youth employment program, assuming the youth is eligible and all application complete, can the youth transfer from the work site as the employer of record to the grant? Transfer from the work site as the employer of record to the grant. Um, 
You know, we'll have to check on that because I, I, I guess it depends on that circumstances of that particular one. Um, nobody can, there's no charges can go to this grant until um, July 1st. So not, nothing can be charged to this grant until, until July 1st. So all I'm saying is if you're, if you're entering youth into this, make sure you have your documentation and eligibility because last thing you want to do is uh, end up with disallowed costs and you've got youth that, are, that you're paying out there that are not going to be eligible for the program. So um, LaDonna, why don't you call me direct and we'll discuss that one. I think that, that it depends on what the circumstances is of that particular program or that particular you lose in that work site. Lisa here has a question. And Lisa, the, the um, Appendix A is in the Procedures Manual, um, which is a downloadable document um, in the Program Overview. She says, how do you, but she says she doesn't see how you prove school lunch eligibility. Oh, school lunch eligibility. Um, you're going to have to work with the local school system because the, the schools are the ones that determine eligibility for um, the participants. So my recommendation okay. is what do you need to do? Oh, I'm sorry. What, um, the, the, the person, the, the client, needs to go to the school and get that documentation. It, 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 the problem with the parent or the student, um, and I'm guessing the parent would have to go and request that documentation from the school system. All right, great. Um, thank you, ladies, Tammy and Sheila, for your time today and uh, sharing your information with the participants that are on the webinar. We will have this recorded session on, available on Illinois WorkNet in uh, your resources section. Tomorrow we will be doing an orientation on the Summer Youth Employment System uh, at 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. It will have screenshots and we will be live at the same time. Payroll uploading and reporting is July 9th and 11th. If I sent, put something in the chat pod earlier that was the wrong dates, I apologize. Uh, we will have our violence prevention required webinars on July 30th at 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. They are two separate webinars, but you need to see both. And we will have a variety of soft skills webinars uh, scattered throughout the month. Please watch for the schedule for dates and times. And our technical assistance questions will uh, webinars will be on July 1st, 16th, 23rd, and 31st. If you have any questions, please uh, check on Illinois WorkNet. And uh, we will uh, see you tomorrow. Uh, required One documents. One additional question was um, required documents. Yeah, required are documents, authorized signature form. And if you're going to designate other ones, the authorized designee form are the two that I need submitted to me today. All right. And thank you very much for your time today. It's 2.04. And we will be seeing everybody probably tomorrow. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody.